Okay, so I guess we can probably get started. Uh, this is uh, Kathleen Dudzinski from DCP, and we have Dr. Heather Hill, who's going to be sharing um, our webinar today. And before we get started, I just want to welcome everyone, and our program will begin in a bit. Um, this is a reminder to let you know that, uh, here, I'll, I'll do a quick, uh, well, a reminder to, I was going to put video, but I think I'll keep that off just to let you know that uh, you should keep your video off unless you'd like to be recorded and included in the webinar area. And we'll keep those microphones muted. Uh, but if you do have questions, please send them to the Dolphin Communication Project uh, as a chat or to everyone as a chat, and we'll get to as many questions at the end as we possibly can. This webinar uh, is being recorded. We'll upload it uh, by tomorrow to the uh, DCP YouTube channel and our website on the um, webinar page of the DCP website. And on the lower left of this particular slide, you can see all the different ways that you can keep in touch with DCP through social media, our website, and email. And also, uh, if you would like to be in the running for an e-kit to help an essential worker or uh, one of the um, e-kits that we offer to those of you that are listening to the webinar, then please send your email address through the chat to the to DCP, and we will put your name in the running for a free uh, dolphin adoption e-kit from DCP. So uh, without further ado, Heather, if you want to unmute yourself and go to your first slide, then uh, your first, yeah, there we go. Um, I am pleased to, uh, introduce Dr. Heather Hill, who is professor at St. Mary's University in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, I and Kel Melillo sweeting from DCP will be monitoring the chat and uh, also the, the webinar. I just want to let folks, I guess I should do the same, right? Um, if I go in there, well, we'll do it here. So I, I should let everyone know that uh, my weather is currently not what it appears behind me. It is a thunder and lightning storm. So if I suddenly disappear, then I will leave this all to uh, Dr. Hill and Kel as well. So without further ado, Heather, feel free to take it away. Awesome. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today and being a part of the uh, webinar today. Um, I had to relocate in my house because there was lots of uh, noise going on in the background. So now I am in a, a different room, which hopefully will uh, be able to not have too many distractions, although the cat might make an appearance in a little bit. Uh, so uh, many, many thanks again for being able to be a part of this and share the work that we've been working um, quite diligently on for a number of years, uh, looking at the idea of creativity in uh, other animals. I'd like to first say thanks to uh, so many collaborators because uh, that's the neat part about collaborating with uh, Dr. Dzinski and Cal and the Dolphin Communication Project is that it truly is a collaborative world effort, not, not just individuals. And so we've been working uh, for a while with Dr. Deirdre Yader and Dr. Don Meltzer from Sacred Heart University with uh, looking at creativity and among uh, a variety of species. Uh, Ms. Terry Bolton from uh, the Roatan Institute for Marine Sciences down in Roatan, uh, Honduras, which is what we're gonna kind of talk more so about today. And of course, Dr. Kathleen Dzinski and helping us to uh, coordinate all of these sorts of things and being a part of, of the project. Uh, so we're going to not uh, spend a lot of time on killer whales and belugas today. We're going to concentrate primarily on uh, bottlenose dolphins and have a few um, highlights of a few other animals, including humans, in this idea of what creativity is and thinking about, uh, about it from a broad perspective. My background actually is in psychology, and I'm considered a, an experimental psychologist, which means that I like to look at lots of questions from different uh, viewpoints. And I particularly like to work within the developmental field and do a lot of uh, research taking in human ideas and, and working um, them into working with animals and seeing if we can adapt that idea and look at various questions within non-human animals. And so creativity is one of those examples in which we are able to look at how we can define it and what we think about it in humans and then start looking at it uh, with other animals. And so uh, one of the distinctions that we want to kind of think about when we think about creativity is that 
oftentimes we're considering the the big C, the, the huge creative genius that's unambiguous, obviously uh, creative achievement, like Michelangelo's um, Sistine Chapel, uh, thinking about some of those uh, musicians uh, like Mozart, uh, being able to just, you know, you're the wow factor. Clearly this is a creative experience and uh, definitely something unique and not everybody can do it. But we also need to think about the little C, the creativity and the everyday experience, the fact that we can uh, be able to, to create things unexpectedly, uh, whether it is the artwork that you see uh, that your children make on a regular basis or uh, you just doodling on the side of your uh, notes when you're taking your you know, notes for studying. So it can be in the stories that you tell, it can be in scrapbooking that you do or even in your teaching. Um, one of the things about being a scientist is that, yes, we think logically, but we also get to think creatively because we have to be able to put things together in different ways. Um, musicians, you know, fiddling around on a guitar is a great example of one of those everyday little types of creativity. So when we start thinking about creativity from a human perspective, we often think uh, a lot about how do you define it? How do we imagine it? What sorts of things are considered to be creative? I just finished teaching a cognitive psychology class and we ended with the idea of creativity and the fact that if you really want to uh, be able to answer questions or come up with more questions or different ways to approach things like in today's world with COVID, where we're trying to really understand what to do and how to work with it, we need to have multiple forms of thinking, not just the divergent thinking that we often think about with creativity, where we're using our imagination, coming up with as many possible solutions and ideas as possible, whether or not they make sense, whether or not they're functional, whether or not we might actually be able to use them. The whole point in divergent thinking is just be crazy and wild and come up with as many brainstorming ideas as possible. But then on the flip side, we think about the idea of logic and the fact that convergent thinking can also be creative because a lot of times when people think about convergent thinking, they're going, oh, the logic, straight and narrow, you're, not, you're, you're, you're following a path like uh, science often does, it seems to be very linear. But in fact, it might not be because how many times does it take for you to pick up all these different pieces of information and then be able to come up with a solution that, that might uh, be the same solution as somebody else or might be a different solution as somebody else? So when we think about the idea of merging these two forms of thinking, which is a lot of what science is like, where you have lots of big ideas, crazy stuff, and then you have those ideas and pieces of information that we now want to come into one kind of uh, solution to be able to figure out what is the answer to, to the thing that we're interested in. And when we combine those two processes, we're really talking about this lateral thinking, this ability to use both processes. And that's kind of what we do in science on a regular basis, is we have a linear path that we follow, but we also want to make sure that we're thinking big picture things and uh, wild and crazy stuff as we can. So one of the questions that we often encounter in terms of humans is how do you measure it? How do you test it? How do you know that somebody's creative? How can you say that you're creative more so than somebody else? I don't consider myself a very creative person when I think about art or, or uh, music, but when it comes to playing with pictures and scrapbooking, I'm a little bit more creative. When it comes to doing some science, I might be a little bit more creative than I typically would think, but we can't just randomly say, I'm creative and you're not, you're not creative. So we've created standardized testing within humans that requires your ability to kind of think about it. We were at this idea of um, looking at how creative can you make a circle and what sorts of images you can do. And I, I would be kind of stuck here on this first line. A sun and a face is about as creative as I can make a circle. But some individuals are really, really thoughtful in how they do things and, and extremely divergent in their thinking. And they do things like creating a button out of the circle or making a plug into an outlet, or my favorite is a person eating a banana. So these are uh, good examples of how people can take a stimulus as simple as two uh, curved lines that don't even make a complete circle and create all kinds of different things out of it. Another type of test that, that we often ask people to do is kind of what we call the brick test. So 
how many ways can you use a brick is, is basically the question. And then the idea is, is how many different solutions or how many different ideas can an individual come up with? So when we start thinking about um, the Torrance test of uh, creative thinking, trying to get some of the stuff off the screen, but um, it is one of the standardized tests that's been uh, pulled into uh, working with children and adults, uh, humans, uh, for a very, very long time, since the 70s. I guess it's a very long time. That makes me kind of old. Um, <laughs> anyway, when we start thinking about how many different ways can we use a brick? Can we use a brick to build a wall? Can we use a brick to build a house? Can we use a brick as a flower, a, a, a flower pot? Can we use a brick to hold down a tarp? Uh, so I tend to think of bricks as functional. Um, but how many different ways we can think about how to use an item or how to use something or how to create an image out of a circle is one of the things that we call fluency. So the Torrance test of creative thinking uh, gives things like the prompts that you saw on the, on the screen before. And then it asks um, different questions about the, the items or the products that are created by the people. And one of those ways that it can begin to assess creative thinking is how many different solutions can you come up with? It doesn't matter if they're good, it doesn't matter if they're bad, it doesn't matter if they're completely uh, unrealistic or completely realistic. What matters is how many is produced. And that's what we call fluency. Now the Torrance tests also look at uh, things that are created by individuals in another way. And that other way of measuring it is something that they call flexibility. So if we think back to our brick example, where I might say a brick can be used to build a wall or a brick can be used to build a house, those are kind of the same sort of category of what a brick can be used for, to build something. But if I'm using a brick as a, a holder for something, whether it's a flower or soil or food, that might be a different category and that might suggest different way of thinking about a brick and, and my flexibility score would be a little bit different. But I can also think about a behavior based on, or a response based on um, how unique it is. How different is it? How atypical is it? So there's lots of ways to think about originality. So some people might choose to use a brick as a weapon. That would be hurtful, but you could potentially use a, a brick as a weapon, or you could use a brick to create an artistic structure. Um, we actually have a, an image of a volleyball outside on our patio right now made out of bricks that my husband put together for my daughter for her birthday a few years ago. That's kind of sad. It's a few years ago. It's been there on the patio for a really long time, but we really love the fact that he can create art out of the, the bricks that he uses. So the ability to use um, an item in a unique way that most people wouldn't normally do would be considered originality. The final aspect of the Torrance test that they uh, are often utilizing to try to evaluate this creativity is what we call elaboration. And this is like how much detail you choose to, to demonstrate. So going back to that brick example, maybe I choose to use a brick to represent the, the headstone for my pet. Um, so, and if I add my pet's name, so we just recently lost our 16 and a half year old dog, uh, Belle. So I might choose to take a brick and put Belle's name on it and put some flowers around it. And if I say I've created a, a headstone for my dog, Belle, then I've elaborated on more than just the brick itself. Or if you see down there at the bottom of your screen, maybe we choose to create a yellow brick road out of bricks and we can add all of the characters from the Wizard of Oz. And now I have elaborated on more than just what a brick is um, as an item, but being used to take a, a group of people to some someplace pretty cool like the city of Oz. So when we start thinking about uh, creativity and uh, looking at this in, in younger children, and the fact that sometimes creativity may in some part be related to your experiences. It may be related to how much uh, you know your vocabulary, um, the things that you've, you've seen over life. Um, but we also know that you know, young children are extremely creative. It really reminds me of the fact that you know, Jean Piaget was a developmental psychologist and he you know, learned everything that he learned about different aspects of, of cognition just from his own three kids. From the very beginning that they were born and the years that he followed them, he called them little scientists. 
because they were willing to test things, because they were willing to try out new things, because they looked at different, uh, at, at the world really differently than what we do as adults or what we do as teenagers. So can we assess creativity in children who don't uh, have a very wide vocabulary? Maybe they don't understand big words. Uh, so we see an image here of, of a couple of preschoolers engaging in different kinds of motor movements with their hands. They're raising their hands, they're rolling their hands, and the two adults are trying to show the girls uh, what, what to do maybe, and then hopefully the girls will expand on that. One of the neat things that we've discovered though about creativity is that well, there is probably an innate component to creativity. Some people just innately are more creative than others. Uh, it is something that we can train. It's something that we can teach. It's something that we can encourage individuals to do more of. Unfortunately, those, those individuals have to work sometimes a little harder, and sometimes you just need the right motivation. You need the right incentive. So we can actually increase creativity in children, uh, elementary children, adolescents, uh, adults, simply by providing them with uh, positive feedback or giving them a star or saying great job um, or being able to, to encourage them more frequently and we see more opportunities for creativity. The downside of it is if you take that reward away, the creativity begins to drop. It doesn't seem to hold or transfer to other situations. So that's one of those aspects that we're really trying to understand about what leads some individuals to maintain that creativity versus others saying, eh, I'm, I'm good enough with my happy face or my son for my circle. So that's part of what we're interested in when we talk about animals is how, how creative are animals? And why is it important? Why do we care about creativity? In the human world, when we think about creativity, we think about uh, a lot of times the artists and, and the musicians and the fact that they can create this beautiful experience um, just almost magically. But we also want to think about the folks that are working in the world of business and the folks that are, are doing the science because being able to come up with, you know, maybe out of the crazy box solutions gets us to places like the moon. It gets us to places into space to be able to look at things that are so far away that we couldn't even imagine that they were there until we started thinking about it. Uh, so, you know, being able to be flexible in your thinking, being able to be uh, elaborative and detailed in your thinking, being original in your thinking really may play a role in your ability to survive and your ability to solve problems. And that's part of the reason why we're interested in looking at creativity in animals, is that when we start thinking about the fact that they can come up with potentially novel solutions or can adapt to changes in their environment, these are things that uh, we're you know, particularly curious about, but we have to figure out how to measure it. So here are a few images. Um, when I typed in to Google for fun, creative, unique, motor positions for animals, it came up with lots of sleeping pictures. Uh, but then you start scrolling through the pictures and man, I tell you, animals can surely get into some very awkward positions. I know Dr. Dzinski's uh, dogs often uh, roll and contort themselves into different uh, positions and my cat her, himself is, is always not quite doing what these cats are doing, laying on a log or, or hanging on the banister, but he can get into some pretty crazy positions that you just wonder, how are they able to be that flexible and do those things? Or you have the monkey on the, on the side of the screen that, that is sitting on its bottom with all four limbs on top of the log and, and is sleeping and hasn't fallen over yet, which is pretty incredible. But really when we start thinking about creativity, we start thinking about you know, things that are sort of almost intentional. Uh, so we have the bower bird who creates the, the bowers. And, and you see all the blue string that's around that bower. And what bowerbirds do is they create, male bowerbirds create these really beautiful, elaborate, uh, creative bowers to bring the females over and to, to encourage the females to come visit them. And the better bowers are the ones that are more creative. They have shinier objects, they have pretty uh, colorful objects, they have a lot of different things around them. And you know, who cares about the bower being well constructed as long as it looks pretty? That seems to be one of the key things for, for the bower birds. And how does that translate into survival for these birds? Well, if you can select a female that has 
good characteristics and or she selected you because you've been able to create this very creative power then theoretically you're going to have more offspring because there will be more females interested in coming to you and you'll have more um, baby birds that hopefully will be uh, healthy uh, birds that will survive and go on then we can also think about the idea of arts art with animals so we know a lot of animals probably don't spontaneously draw or or do things like you see with the elephant in the picture at the bottom there but they can be reinforced to begin to do those things and you know you ask yourself is this elephant painting this picture because it's going to get a peanut or a favorite type of browse after uh, picking up the the paintbrush um, is the elephant painting the picture because the elephant you know finds some pleasure or comfort in it hard to say but we do know that they are capable of being trained to be able to produce a an artwork like this or even something more extravagant if you were to go uh, do a Google search real quick and see what kinds of art uh, some elephants are able to create. So when we start thinking about creativity within the world of uh, dolphins, it's been around a while. Uh, looking at creativity from a, a not really a research point of view, but a functional point of view has been going on since the 60s when Karen Pryor decided to uh, train a couple of rough tooth dolphins that, that she had, uh, that she was working with and, and looking to see how can we increase the number of behaviors that they'll perform. So dolphins will naturally do things like jump in the air, they uh, will twist their bodies in the air, they swim really fast, they can uh, do cool somersaults underwater or above water, they can do a lot of different things. Um, but they can do even more when you start getting them to think about it. And so part of uh, understanding how to train creative behavior is really kind of taking uh, advantage of what they do naturally and enhancing it. And you enhance it by telling them, hey, let's learn a game. And this game is what we call a concept because I can't tell it often, I want you to perform a behavior you haven't performed before. I want, I have to tell them that through um, no words. The only tools I have to explain what I want these animals to do is a whistle that we use for a, a bridge to say, hey, good job, and the fish or the food that we would give them on a normal basis. And so only when they do something that they haven't done before will they receive the reward. And then they do that when we ask them for it. So kind of like in Simon Says for children, you say, you know, Simon Says, lift your right arm, so let's lift our right arms. Um, Simon told us to do that, but maybe Simon says, hey, do something you haven't done before. And so somebody may stand there and go, mm, how about shake my head back and forth? Okay, great, that's a good job. So this is what we try to do with, with animals without any kind of human words to be able to tell them what it is we're looking for. So Karen Pryor and her team were able to train a couple of uh, rough tooth dolphins to be able to create truly novel behaviors, which is like super, super hard because when you ask them just to do something, a lot of times they can come up with something they've done before, but to really get them to understand in their head, it can't just be what I've done before, it's gotta be something that I've never done before, it has to be completely original. That was pretty tough for her animals to figure out, but they did and they were able to increase uh, the number of behaviors they, they've had in their repertoire that they were working with. So we've since applied this to lots of other animals. We've done it with sea lions, um, we've done it with different bottlenose dolphins, we've uh, worked with dogs. Uh, Karen Pryor came up, uh, I think it was Karen Pryor came up with a, this idea of 101 things to do with a box that you can give to a dog. My, my cat likes to sleep in the box, my dogs, when I had my dogs, they like to eat the boxes. Um, and sometimes they would put the toys in the boxes. So they would do different things, but this is something that we could either ask them to do on their own with no treats, or we could encourage them to do it by adding treats each time they did something different with a box. So sea lions, when they were tested um, back in the uh, late, uh, late 70s, early 80s, they had this opportunity to just produce any behavior. It didn't have to be completely new like the dolphins. They were able just to produce whatever they had, had not produced before. And then we added to that with some additional dolphins um, where now it was much more controlled and now it was more of a question of doesn't have to produce a novel behavior, you just can't produce the behavior you produced 
most recently. And so Lou Herman uh, worked with a couple of uh, dolphins and he and a number of students uh, produced a lot of work out of this idea of let's, treat, let's create and produce different behaviors, but how we chose to measure what they were doing depended on what they were trained to do. So one of the more recent types of research that's, that's come out about looking again at creativity and starting to really evaluate it from a creativity measure, not just can you produce a novel behavior, not just can you produce a different behavior, but let's really start digging in, kind of like the Torrance test. Let's start looking at originality. Let's look at elaboration. Let's look at flexibility. Let's think about um, this notion of, of fluency, how many different performance be, behaviors can be performed. And so uh, Stan Kuchai and Holly Eskalinen uh, were able to train three male dolphins on uh, this create again, using their whistles and using their fish. And Holly and her team at Dolphins Plus was able to show um, that their dolphins were pretty creative. So I'm gonna start with uh, this video Hopefully it plays, and then I'll show you a little bit about some of the data that they found. So let's see if it will pop up and work. There we go. Okay, so this was done at Dolphins Plus with Holly Eskalinen and Stan Kuchai. So you see sometimes we get above surface video and sometimes we get below surface video. So hopefully you were able to hear a lot of the sounds that the dolphin was making in addition to seeing a lot of the behaviors that he was showing off. So he did a lot of actually high energy behaviors combined with the whistles where he was whistling and, and um, moving in one direction or, or diving in another direction or swimming around and, and doing a different kind of foghorn noise. So this animal, um, as you saw, the, the trainer had learned the concept create and the trainer basically had taught this animal to every time you see my hands do something like this, you need to go do something that you haven't done before. Now, the, the rules for this game weren't that he had to do anything novel. He just had to do something different from what he'd done immediately before he'd performed that behavior. Now, what they decided to look at was the complexity of the behavior. So things like how many behaviors were combined in that one experience um, when she gave the, the hand signal, how many different things did the dolphin do at the same time, whistle, foghorn, uh, move their mouth, shake their head, and move in a different direction at one time. They also wanted to know how many behaviors could they perform um, on their own. They're choosing to do these behaviors. They're not told which behaviors to do. They're coming up with them on their own. How many could they do in a row before they started repeating or, or, or going back into something they'd done before? They also looked at things like the energy of the behavior. So low energy, moderate energy, or high energy, and then of course the originality of the behavior. So their three dolphins um, were pretty good at being able to produce a certain number of, of new behaviors, kind of a measure of fluency, um, if you were to think about Torrance test, where Leo did quite well. He was able to produce um, 10 behaviors that were not uh, repetitions of things that he'd done in a given session or on a trial. Um, Kimbit and Alphonse, kind of a little less, but they did, still did really well with how many behaviors they were able to perform. Um, so then if we looked at, you know, kind of this idea of flexibility with the degree of energy shown in the behaviors, we see that Leo actually is pretty cool because he likes to do high energy behaviors. That takes a lot of effort. That takes a lot of thinking. To me, that suggests that this is kind of fun. Uh, but he also does those medium and low behaviors. And then let's take Kimbit and Alphonse. They're pretty good about doing those low behaviors not so interested in doing those moderate to high energy behaviors. So you can start to see some of the individual differences and preferences with these creative kinds of ideas if we consider energy as a way to measure creativity. 
And then finally, when we start thinking about just how creative are these animals, how novel are these animals with the kinds of behaviors they do, we see that Leo, you know, he's, he's doing pretty well with the novelty uh, function. Alphonse is pretty close to him as well, and Kemet's down there, but he's still, he's still there. So again, these are the sorts of things that we might be interested in looking at with, obviously with humans, but how can we start to look at it and compare it evenly, comparably, not apples to oranges, but apples to apples across one animal species to another animal species. And that's really what, what we're here to try to kind of figure out uh, as an experimental psychologist or as a comparative psychologist, which is what I'm also considered. Um, so here is uh, a little bit of the work that we've been doing through Dolphin Communication Project uh, down at the Roatan Institute for Marine Sciences in beautiful Roatan, Honduras. And uh, they have an amazing facility uh, as well as many of the others that we've seen these done in with this natural lagoon uh, and have been working on this behavior for quite a while actually. So uh, Stan Kuchai, who was part of the, the study performed at Dolphins Plus, um, started working with the folks down at REMS to uh, see if they'd be willing to, to teach their animals create. Uh, and there are lots of reasons to do that, which I'll go over in just a minute, but I wanted to share this video with you first that was produced by John Anderson through Terramar Productions. He did a phenomenal video, and hopefully you guys had a chance to see it on the DCP website. If you haven't, I'd say it's well worth your 12 minutes. Um, of time because it's, it is not only just beautiful to, to look at, but it has a lot of really great information in it about the idea of creativity and how to train it and um, why it's important to think about. So let's spend a, a few minutes watching this video uh, and then we'll, we'll continue moving on. So hopefully you enjoy it. Oh no, let's see, go back. Let's try it again. Okay, there we go. Individuality or personality can dictate how long Terry trains a dolphin for the CREATE study. In Lenka's case, he was a quick learner and well suited to these cognitive tests. Hold on now. Lenka understands that Terry's hand signal, or SD, with palms up and thumbs and pointer finger touching, means that Terry is asking him to choose any behavior that he wants. As long as each sequential behavior Lenka offers is different, he'll get a fish. The scale of difference between behaviors allows for fewer or more fish per behavior. Mouth open. Mouth open. Did you see that? Yeah. <clears throat> Jaw pot is what it's. Jaw pot. Silly. I reinforce more heavily the more different the behavior is. If, if yes. they sink down to the bottom and open their mouth or sink to the bottom and blow bubbles, and the next behavior is an aerial, they're going to get a magnitude of reinforcement for that. Okay. Versus doing one vocal and then the next time doing just a different vocal. They'll still get rewarded because it's different and they have to know that it's different, but it's still a vocal. Four humans involved in this research only play an observational role. Lenka, the dolphin, plays the key role. He chooses what he wants to do, a leap, a vocal, or a sing. What Lenka chooses to do and how he does it is a measure of his innovation, his creativity. Instead of us always commanding them to do something, it's us giving them the chance to choose to do something. Okay. And that's why it's so fun, and that's why I think they never leave and they don't get bored, because they get the choice. And I'm finding that that's really important to these guys, as we found in their social setting. They want to choose who they hang out with. They don't always want to be paired up with the same animal. So choice is important to them. So I think that's why they like this type of training so much, because they get to choose. Good boy. Okay, so what would like you a, call that, Terry? A vertical sink with a rollover. Vertical sink rollover. The That's applications like, for the results of this study are twofold. Historically, nonverbal children are often overlooked or viewed as not smart because intelligence tests don't often focus on nonverbal behaviors or responses. But if trainers can teach animals to show us how innovative they can be just by asking them to do something new, scientists can present those responses as a tool to understanding cognitive function, then we may be able to apply this approach to better understanding the cognitive abilities of children, 
develop along a different path than typically expected. For wild populations, this research will offer insight into how dolphins might adapt to unpredictable situations or environments, and not only survive, but thrive. Okay, so hopefully you uh, had a chance to, to really enjoy and, and experience what uh, the animals do with the two videos that you've now seen on, on different ways of, of showing off CREATE. Um, kind of a couple of things within that video, it not only talked about how CREATE is trained, but it also talked about uh, the fact that the animals find it uh, pleasurable and reinforcing. Uh, simply through their behaviors, though, they keep coming back. So, uh, and, and trying it over and over again, whether they were right or wrong the previous time. And I don't know if you happened to hear when uh, Terry was whistling her, 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 her bridging and, and blowing her whistle to tell Linka that he had done a good job. He also engaged in a little victory squeal that says, yay, I did it. Uh, and we've seen in other research that that victory squeal is associated with a lot of really positive things. So being asked to think, being asked to do things flexibly, being asked to do things um, imaginatively seems to be quite enriching for these animals. And it's something that uh, they apparently enjoy doing, even if they are, are not always doing it correctly. Uh, the other piece about that is this idea of if we can show how creative they are when they're asked to do it by a person, um, their, their trainer, how does that translate into their spontaneous behavior, into their, nor their natural behavior and behavior when there isn't a trainer around, when they are just swimming? So we saw um, one of the, the calves, actually juvenile, who was playing with a stick at the end uh, there of that, at that sequence. And, and that's part of our uh, bigger question is, how can we relate what these animals are doing when they're under what we call stimulus control? So they're performing a behavior that we've asked them to do now that they've learned what it means, which takes a while to do. So I was saying that uh, Dr. Stan Kuchai had started this process back in um, the early 2000s, mid 2000s with Terry and her team at REMS to try to get these animals to, to learn this behavior. Now what's kind of cool about the history of the create behavior with bottlenose dolphins in particular is that Pretty much from 1969, when Karen Pryor published her first paper on the creative corpus, to the most uh, recent work with Holly and Stan in 2014, they've only tested seven dolphins, which have included a couple of females and mostly males. And what's really neat about adding the REMS animals, and I know that there are other facilities that have also performed this, uh, taught this behavior in different ways, and that's one of our goals, is to start kind of comparing across the facilities, across the individuals, we were able to double that sample size with the Roatan animals by adding another seven animals, which was pretty cool um, about being able to do this. But it's not a behavior that for dolphins, the way that it's trained is going to happen overnight. It takes some time to do because you're training a concept. And where with children, I can kind of teach what I want them to think about with a concept or with teenagers, I can talk about concepts in my, my classes. And they get, they understand it because I'm able to use my, my human words. But when I want to teach a concept to an, a non-human animal, it makes it a lot harder because now they have to do a lot of trial and error. They've got to kind of figure out what it is that you want them to, to do. So create a behavior that is taught a lot of different facilities, a lot of zoos, a lot of aquariums, a lot of different animals, because it is a, it is a behavior that is enriching. It's something that they seem to enjoy doing. It challenges them, it, it uh, makes them think. It's a neat behavior to demonstrate uh, to humans um, who are coming in and taking a look at them. And so when you choose to teach this create concept, this idea of being innovated and performing different behaviors on command, um, or when asked to do so, you, you have different reasons for doing it. So you might choose to do it for enrichment, you might choose to do it to create new behaviors that you want to add into that animal's repertoire, um, like Karen Pryor did. It might be that we want to see how good are they at performing you know, a single behavior and then coming up with more complex or a composite behavior or a chain of behaviors. Um, and then the way that we're looking at it at this point is we're interested in it for the research purposes, looking to see can we um, imagine what this behavior is and how does it compare to other, other experiences. So um, back in 2004, uh, Allison Kaufman and James Kaufman put out a paper that basically talked about the idea of how can we um, 
take create and look at this uh, look at this concept and be able to measure it coming from a human developmental perspective. Can we apply uh, belief, you know, ideas like Torrance's four factors, the fluency, the flexibility, the elaboration, the originality to a, an animal um, and be able to define and measure what their creativity looks like? And they added to this idea in 2011, and I know that they've been extremely involved within the world of animal creativity, and they've actually uh, produced, a, edited a book with a lot of different ideas of innovation and innovative thinking and um, different kinds of foraging techniques. So there are lots of reasons as to why we might be interested in creativity. Now, the purpose, your end goal, whether you want to do it for enrichment or increase a behavior repertoire or just compare whether they can do a single behavior or a more complex behavior or understand what's going into why they produce what they produce, uh, really matters how you train it. And just if you are interested in doing something um, and how to teach a game on create with another animal, you, you have a few tools that kind of need to be considered. First of all, we want to work with experienced trainers. Um, being able to know that your animal, a couple of things, you need to know that the animal hasn't performed that behavior before, or they've performed a part of it, but haven't gone as far as they just did. Uh, they need to be able to recognize that the animal might get becoming frustrated because we know that with our own selves, the more mistakes we make, the more frustrated we get, the less we want to continue on with that behavior. But sometimes some of us are really uh, have a lot of perseverance and we are going to do it no matter what until we finally figure out the answer and we're going to get it. Um, but that experienced trainer is particularly good at being able to read those behavioral cues, at being able to read the fact that, okay, this animal is trying, they're working hard, we should reinforce this little, little baby step, the shaped experience um, before they, they decide they don't want to play for that particular time frame. So having an, an, an experienced trainer who has a lot of um, understanding of the animals they're working with, a lot of knowledge about what that animal is capable of doing is really important in managing how to learn how to do this. Does that mean an amateur or a person without experience, without training shouldn't try this? Nope. But what I would say is make sure your dog can sit first before you start trying to create uh, the concept of create within, within working with your dog or your cat. Uh, that way you have uh, opportunities to make errors and the easy stuff like learning to sit or spinning in a circle or um, batting at a feather uh, before you start asking them to think more cognitively, more creatively. Uh, you need frequent sessions, just like you do with any other behavior. Uh, this isn't something that you want to sit down and try in one, one fell swoop when we work with children. We're not asking them to do a, a hundred trials in one session. We might ask them to do five or ten trials as we're trying to get them to figure things out. And then we might increase the number of, of trials within that particular session. But you do it little by little, and it ultimately ends up with this really cool behavior. And we also need to recognize, just like in humans, not all animals are great fits for this particular behavior because it requires them to be energetic. It requires them to think and try different stuff. Um, curiosity really plays a role, and that was something that you know Stan Kuchai really, really pushed a whole lot when he started thinking about the importance of play and and Piaget and the idea that you know children are little scientists, animals can be scientists um, in the sense that they're curious and they want to try different stuff and that they just are generally playful. Um, I, I think about uh, a game that I play in one of my classes that uh, basically utilizes these skill sets that you would do for uh, dolphin training or dog training, and it's called the training game. And I basically give the rules and I say, the only piece of information you're gonna get from me is the word good, or sometimes you use a clicker and I click it when uh, they, uh, the individual who is volunteering to be trained to perform a behavior. Now, I try to train them just like I, I train an animal where I have no words. I can't tell them anything about what it is that I'm looking for. The only cue that they have to know that they're doing the right thing is kind of like um, hot and cold. You're getting closer to what you want and where it is um, when you hear the word hot and you're farther away from it when you hear the word cold. They get to hear the word good or they hear a clicker. And a lot of times it's just silly things like getting them to spin in a circle or, or walking to the door, but I have to work on making sure that I'm reinforcing the right behavior, which might not be the full behavior, but a little baby portion. And I often tell my students who are gonna volunteer for the training game to be my, my guinea pig, so to speak, 
um, that they need to be willing to try different stuff. Uh, they can't be embarrassed, they can't have anything. So I do give them that little bit of information and, and it's pretty interesting how, uh, how quickly a lot of them kind of figure out what, what they're supposed to do. Sometimes they have to ask for help uh, from the, uh, their peers. Now, we've been working on this behavior. It was a continuation um, at RIMS from Stan Kuchai's original work that he, was, he started with uh, Terry and the group uh, back in uh, the, the mid-2000s. And we, uh, with his passing, we sort of carried on the legacy and wanted to kind of see the end point of this particular study um, with the collaborative efforts of, of Kathleen and DCP and REMS. So we've had the pleasure of uh, testing our animals now at, at REMS, the dolphins down there, to, and, and started looking at some of those measures that, that might be usable um, in terms of fluency. How many possibly behaviors can they produce in, in one session that are new? Um, so you can see that we tested uh, 12 animals over a, a period of four sessions in these graphs that you're seeing uh, up here on the left-hand side. And they're producing um, anywhere on average, and we're talking 12 animals, so they're doing pretty well, uh, 15 up to uh, 24 behaviors uh, on average of, of new things that, that are in that given session. So they're doing quite well in terms of the of fluency. We've also uh, measured things like how many times do the, can they perform a different behavior before they start repeating a behavior. This one's not quite as high as they do across the full session, but some of them can on average perform two behaviors before they try to repeat. Some of them perform three behaviors before they try to repeat. So a lot of what we're finding with the results of our, of our dolphin work is that it really just depends on how much experience the animals have and it really depends on the training that was uh, given to them and, and what sorts of things were, were uh, reinforced. Um, so one of those aspects that we're kind of curious about from the research side is how much does previous history play a role? How does the training technique um, play a role in the behaviors that are ultimately shown for us uh, when we look at, at it from a testing perspective? Now our colleagues at Sacred Heart have been working on the same question with preschoolers where they have the same kind of game um, that we ask the dolphins to do, but the preschoolers only get a couple of sessions to practice in, and then we are testing them. But if we start looking at dolphin behavior based on a low, medium, or high energy level, just like Holly and Stan did and their Dolphin Plus data, we see that uh, there's a little bit of variability in what preschoolers and dolphins are willing to do. So dolphins are very willing to perform low energy behaviors. Preschoolers are more willing to perform medium energy behaviors. And then if you see both of them on average, not so much in terms of the high energy behaviors. So there does seem to be some individual differences within that. So ultimately, when we get to the end of this project, and, it, and hopefully it never ends, it's so much fun, it's so exciting, there's so many different ways to uh, expand on it. Uh, really, you know, one of those things, not only is it just to look at how do, how do other animals do with this task and how do they perform if we were to measure in the same ways that we're measuring with dolphins, but we also wanna know how does it relate to their natural behavior, to the behaviors they just do for fun when they're on their own and there aren't, anybody around, um, maybe to their intelligence. So Dr. Don Meltzer, uh, developmental psychologist at Sacred Heart University and Dr. De Deirdre Gator are asking these questions with preschool children and playing a game with them. And then they're measuring the same way we're measuring the dolphins, uh, what kinds of behaviors they produce. How elaborate are they? How flexible are they? If we were to use the ideas that the Kaufmans decide, uh, thought might be useful um, incorporating the, the Torrance test into looking at creativity in other animals. And then our uh, colleague, Dr. Lauren Highfill at Eckerd College has also expanded on this study and started uh, pulling in dogs. And what's really neat about the dog research is that she's doing it with citizens, part of the citizen science movement that we've seen a lot of within the science, scientific community. So she has a Facebook page called The Creative Canine where she has put out uh, the idea that anybody that has a dog that likes to train their dogs and wants to train their dog on Create, um, come join her study and you uh, show us the progress of your animal as, as they are uh, learning this behavior. And then you go through official test sessions and then she actually has the intelligence test for a dog that she's created um, to try to measure if the animals have had uh, this experience, what, what does it do? as an outcome for, for another problem that they have to solve. 
So it's really, really neat to see the collaborative efforts that uh, Dolphin Communication Project has really inspired among a lot of individuals. Uh, Stan Kuchai, my mentor, um, really kind of got us all going on all of these sorts of things. And it's just awesome to be able to compare the kinds of behaviors that you think wow, how do you measure creativity in humans? And now we're gonna start thinking about it in other animals. Um, really is just amazing. And, and truly the art and the science or the divergent and the convergent forms of thinking that we might be uh, curious about in, in a variety of animals. So with that, I'd like to say thank you all for your attention and uh, your willingness to get through the snafu of our, uh, apparently my system falling down. And if there's questions, I think that they've got a plan for how to, how to answer those. Well, thank you, Heather. I appreciate that. And, and uh, as you talked about the creative canine from, from Lauren, uh, I did uh, enter Dixie and Baloo, our beagles, into the creative canine. I am loath to uh, admit that I had to withdraw them because of my schedule and I couldn't do the, the programs consistently, although it was quite entertaining in that Dixie got the concept and started giving me new behaviors up to about four or five before she'd look at me for a hint. And Baloo um, only rarely got beyond her excitement to um, that she was getting a treat to, to do something new in that, in that respect. So I'm gonna put my video on. Um, we do have a couple of questions. Uh, we had a, a question that I was able to write down from the pre-session. And um, Eric was asking, uh, could you have a free time period at the end of a training session and reward the dolphins who come up with the best performance in a way to reward creativity? So I, I thought maybe you could comment on that. Yeah, that's a, that's a really great idea. It'd be another variation, I think, of, of what we could you know, encourage them to do. So if, so if I understand the question right, it sounds like uh, you do a create session and then you have a free period and you look to see uh, what, what are the animals doing for the next 10 minutes in terms of the actions. Yeah, absolutely. That would be a really great way to, to begin to, to measure creativity as it was immediately influenced uh, or, mm -hmm. or behaviors that are performed as it was immediately influenced by a, a session like that. Yeah, that's awesome. Great idea. And I thought that just for, for my addition to that is I thought that would be interesting to then inform how we study the behavior of, of the wild dolphins that we record video of, because this, the whole idea behind looking at creativity with the dolphins at RIMS also allows us to potentially look at how we might be able to measure creativity among animals that we're just simply watching, that we're not asking to do anything, which I thought would be pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously, that's the big picture question is, you know, how would you take something under, you know, very controlled circumstances and then apply it into that real, real big system where we aren't, we're just simply observing, we're just a member of, of that. And I yeah. think that's really where um, it would be fascinating. I think there is a, a recent study that that's looking at personality in wild dolphins based on their behaviors, um, a variety of behaviors like foraging and those sorts of things. So definitely uh, that, that, that would be great. Very cool. Well, I, I'm, I think Cal had a couple of questions that, that came into her that she wanted to ask. And so I'll save my last one if we have time for after that. Okay. So one question that came in is um, kind of a, a broad thing and specific to you. Um, but what would you say the most surprising either result or the most challenging thing in setting up this work um, with measuring creativity in dolphins? Oh, those are two, two very, <laughs> very big questions. Um, I think the most I think the most surprising thing, and although it probably isn't that surprising when you start thinking about it, the most surprising thing is um, the, the variability that, uh, that you see in the animals based on the experiences that they've had. So, so you're, you're theoretically training each animal the same way, but they receive it very differently. And the behaviors that are, are produced are just are, are, are pretty crazy. So, so like down there in the, in the image below, um, this, this dolphin uh, decided that his creative behavior was to come target on somebody. Um, and, and, you know, 
as we were deciding, is that a creative behavior? Well, it's a different behavior and it's something that he hasn't done before and it's truly a novel behavior. So I think in, in the first question, uh, the, the surprising thing for me really has just been, you know, the variability and, and the um, just truly incredible uh, innovation that these animals are capable of doing. And then in terms of, you know, the setting up of, of the, the studies and stuff, uh, coordination. I mean, that's uh, bottom line is coordination and patience, I think are the two, two big key things with working with uh, research in, in settings with animals that require a lot of training. Um, you know, a lot of research, trying to conduct research uh, that requires training for at facilities that aren't, you know, research-based facilities, um, you have to have a lot of patience. And so you have to recognize that this isn't a, you know, we may develop a study that we say, oh, and the best case scenario should take us six months, but really it may take 10 years, like it is in the, in the case that we're seeing at the end of this thing. So, um, but that's awesome because that means I can come down and, and go to Roatan or go to other facilities and, and uh, spend lots of quality time with some really great people and animals. Thank you. This, this question, I'm, I'm gonna kind of merge some of my thoughts into an audience question. Um, so one, I, I mean, I find it very helpful when um, descriptions about non-human animals can be kind of put into human terms and, and given a human example. And I think that helps us learn and imagine and, and be able to relate to the study of the non-human animals. But do you find that that is ultimately helpful um, to, to be comparing the dolphins to humans? Or do you think sometimes that actually makes the research harder because it's, it's in the human box? That's a really, really great question. So, um, so the big term for all of that is sort of this anthropocentric, anthropomorphic idea. Uh, and, you know, I, I come at it both ways. The, the coming at it from a human perspective allows us to be able to begin the imaginative process of understanding what could we be asking the animals, potentially. But then we have to remember that they aren't humans. They, they have evolved in a different environment. They have different environmental pressures. They have different problems that they have to solve in their, in their natural habitats. And so th at that point, we need to take our human perspective out and, and do our best to do what actually humans are really good at, which is perspective taking and theory of mind kinds of stuff, and try to put ourselves into their heads and to recognize what their world is like. You know, a dolphin's world is very different from a human world. It's very different from a primate world. They're living in a three-dimensional world that upside down is right side up. And, and that's a completely foreign concept for us. And they can see things through echolocation that most of us, you know, can't. You know, we have to rely on vision to be able to, to see our world and to experience things. So I think when we start looking at that comparative psychology approach, yeah, you need, you know, a lot of times we do need to come at it from what we're most familiar with, which is ourselves. But then we need to remember, okay, that's given us maybe the, the guidelines to start with, but then we need to make sure we remind ourselves to put it back into their perspective, which is those big questions. So yes, great, these animals can um, learn to perform a creative behavior on command that a, a human has asked them to do, how does that translate into their, their normal world? Does it change their, their creativity um, in terms of how they forage? One, one of the things that I wanted to mention earlier, now I'm gonna mention it because I got two seconds. Um, you know, when we start thinking about the different foraging techniques that dolphins do in different areas of the world, whether it's a killer whale or a bottlenose dolphin or a spotted dolphin, um, they do things that are, are crazy, like pulling sponges off the, off the floor to, to cover their rostrums so that they don't, you know, their rostrums don't get beat up when they're searching around for the types of food that they like to eat, or maybe even putting a conch shell over their rostrum and carrying that around to keep things, you know, kind of safe over here as they're looking for their food. Um, killer whales will beach themselves, which is not a really smart thing to do for <laughs> a very large animal, but Apparently, it's an effective technique for some of the animals. They're able to pull down sea lions, penguins, and, and seals without harming themselves um, in the process. But that's not something every killer whale does. It's not something that every killer whale population does, but it's something that they figured out how to do, and they repeat it, which 
sometimes it looks like they're not doing it for the food purposes, they're doing it because it may be fun. So I think that's, that's a really great question and very, very important for us to always think about when we're doing any kind of comparative work. The human perspective really gives you that, that baseline to begin to start asking those questions, but I think we can get really interesting and creative if we start looking at it from the animal's perspective as much, best as we can. Thank you so much for that. Um, we have one more question if, if we have time, um, and hopefully I'll, I'll get this one right. Um, I think this listener is, is wondering if we know anything about um, trauma, uh, emotional or mental psychological trauma in dolphins and whether or not they can kind of carry any past fears or experiences. And so I think that's part A, do we even know about that? And then part B, do you see that potentially influencing individuals, uh, individual dolphins' interest in participating in these research studies? Hmm, that's a, that's a really interesting question. I think um, to answer the first part, can, do we understand and, and recognize or can we measure trauma within a, a species like this? I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, we, we have attempted, I think there have been times in which we're attempting to understand potentially their behaviors that they might show if they're under stress. Um, but like many animals, they often hide those, the, 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 any kind of stress or experiences that they, they might have had in the past. Uh, because that's not a safe thing to show as a weakness if you're looking at it from an evolutionary perspective or an ecological perspective. So, um, you know, could, could we understand if these animals had a, a past experience that potentially could be traumatic and could affect their interaction with the trainer? Well, well sure. I mean, if we see, think about it like with dogs, you know dogs that have been abused because, you know, by a, a person because they will show specific fears to individuals of that type of person. And if it's a large enough fear, it may be broadly generalized to all people. Um, so we would be looking for behaviors sort of like that. But in my experience, uh, you know, I think it, it's an individual by individual basis. And in my experience, the majority of the animals that I've worked with, to me, haven't shown any kind of uh, expression of, of past traumas. Um, would that affect the kind of research that we are doing if we asked them to do it? Well, of course it would, because it would suggest that they, they wouldn't want to participate, they wouldn't, want, they wouldn't come over and engage in the interactions. And I think that's one of the things that Terry really um, made a, an excellent point, and I think also seen in the Dolphins Plus video. Uh, these animals have the freedom to leave you. They don't, they aren't, you're not holding them like your children. You can't force them to go from this location to this location. They aren't like dogs in some cases where you can pick them up and carry them around and do what you want with them. They, they can leave. They don't have to come back. They don't have to do those things. And I think that's, um, that's particularly important in any of this stuff is the opportunity for choice and the opportunity for, for being able to do that. And I think if, if anything, if an animal refused to come, is that because of a trauma? Eh, maybe. Is it because the current social circumstances are suggesting don't want to be there? That's possible too. How do you differentiate between the two of them? It takes time to figure it out. Thank you. Um, sure. I know we're, we're running a little bit late because of our, our tech hiccup. Um, and I think some people are starting to, to leave the more meeting because I'm sure they have places to go. Um, do you have another slide there, Heather? The DCP slides? Um, yeah, so just sure. a reminder, we already talked about this, so, but that just gives you a visual for the, what the DCP website looks like and where you can find the webinars. Um, and then um, make sure to tune in, if we could have the next slide, Heather, um, our dolphin pod and then our webinar series. So next Tuesday is the next one, that's at noon. Um, we just got the time on that. And then Thursday is also at noon. And then lastly, um, just a reminder of how you can stay in touch with us um, with our social media on the last slide, Heather. Um, so email, Facebook, um, Twitter, all of that good stuff, uh, stay in touch. And right now we are still, we're just gonna keep doing it um, for as long as we can. If you support DCP, um, through any of those starred items there, you can choose an essential worker or just someone in your life who's, you know, having a hard time with this pandemic business. Um, and we will give them a free 
electronic dolphin adoption kit. And then of course your support helps allow us to keep these things, uh, webinars and such free for you to listen to. So thank you for your support. Dr. Hill, thank you so much for leading today's talk and being flexible and willing to, to roll with technology. Um, we appreciate all of your insight and everything you offered us. Thank you very thank much you. for the chance. It was lots of fun. So thanks everybody for joining and hopefully we will see you at another webinar.